You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it is said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good, and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Well, good morning again, friends, and welcome back for what is the final week of a sermon series we've been in for actually the last several weeks. If you're here for the very first time or tuning in for the very first time, we've been in a conversation ever since early September, a conversation titled Life Goals, Seven Steps to a More Meaningful Life. For the last several weeks, we've been asking this question of scripture, which is where? How, what steps or sacrifices or exchanges might we make in order to cultivate a more meaningful life, a more purpose-filled life, one that matters more than the life we're living right now? And so if this is uh, your first time with us, uh, to catch you up a little bit, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, we've talked about the call, uh, the invitation from God to exchange a busy life for a still and a centered life. We talked about the exchange you see in Scripture uh, to swap out a stingy life for a generous life. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the importance of uh, living a self-controlled life rather than one that's always reacting impulsively to the people around us, what people are saying around us, what people are doing around us. And today, for this last week of this conversation, we're going to talk about one other invitation we see in the Gospels, the invitation from Jesus to find a meaningful life by choosing a life of love rather than a life of hatred. And with the election just nine days away, (laughs) this feels like a very appropriate place to land the plane. Now I get it. Even saying that out loud, that we only have nine days, causes many of us angst, doesn't it? Many of us are anxious about the outcome of the election. We are anxious about what it might mean for the relationships in our lives with friends, family members, coworkers that are already strained. What's going to happen on the other side of that? Or maybe for you, it's just bigger. It's, I'm so concerned about the fact that we're already super divided. What's the country going to look like two weeks from now? And to be very clear, those things do concern me. But as your pastor... Can I tell you the thing that scares me the most? The thing that concerns me the most is that when I survey uh, the state of our current political discord, what concerns me is what it is doing to the American Christian. What concerns me as a pastor, 
as a Christian myself, is that when I look around at the dialogue that we're participating in, how we show up and exchange with those we disagree with, at present, we don't look any different than the rest of the world. We don't sound any different in how we disagree and dialogue with people across the aisle. In fact, you might even make the argument that Christians are doing worse uh, than uh, the surrounding culture and society around us. Case in point, this week alone, this week alone, uh, I was on Facebook, you know, the place where really good dialogue and discourse happens. <laughs> and I noticed, I noticed uh, two exchanges, one between a couple of friends of mine and another between two family members of mine. And they resulted at one point in the dialogue to saying this to one another. So one friend said to the other one, well, obviously, the way you think uh, and the way you see things means you're not a real Christian. You weren't uh, one of the real ones uh, to begin with. And then it wasn't a day later, I saw two family members uh, sort of talking back and forth. And the other one, very condescendingly, goes, well, I love you and I care about you. Is that a concern for you that I feel like I need to tell you that beliefs like that, well, they'll land you in the naughty place. Maybe you've seen worse. Maybe you've heard worse these last several weeks and months. And I'll tell you, as I sort of came back to our scripture passage this week and I reread Matthew chapter 5, which by the way, Matthew chapter 5 is not the deep tracks. This is Jesus' greatest hits. Like, you can't say you walked in here today and said, holy cow, this is new, new teaching. Holy thrill, this is interesting. You guys doing like a new rebranding campaign? Like, we've been talking about this since the beginning. But if you dare to call yourself a follower of Jesus, one of the hallmark attributes, one of the characteristics we're supposed to be known for is people who show kindness, decency, and love towards the people we don't agree with. And so what was so startling to me was this week when I reread Matthew chapter 5 and I thought about the world in which I currently inhabit, I struggled to figure out who the heck he's actually talking about. I struggled to figure out who, who's doing this. How did we get here? Well, for starters, Jesus says, and now we're going to get into our passage for today. So if you have your Bibles and you want to go back to Matthew chapter 5, or if you're watching this online and want to grab a Bible and follow along with us, Jesus has a hunch. Jesus has a hunch as to how we get to uh, this type of place. And he leads off in verse 43 by saying this, you have heard that it was said that you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you. Now, let's back up to that first sentence. What's so fascinating about you have heard it said, where they did not hear that was in temple, in church, in their religious settings. To be very clear about something, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, you can totally like love the people that you like and like hate on the people that you don't like. It doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. So what does that mean? That means that at some point or another, the people of God decided to amend the commandment a little bit. They decided to alter that commandment found in Leviticus to make it match a little bit more of what they see when they look around at the other nations, the other people groups, and how they're treating one another and how they're dialoguing with one another. And they provided a little amendment to that commandment to say, well, we, this is how we prefer to treat those who we don't think the same, we don't believe the same, we don't act the same, we don't vote the same. This is how we want to do it. It's more convenient this way. And as a result, they found themselves in a situation not too dissimilar from the situation we find ourselves in today. Case in point, a study came out out of Stanford, uh, not Stanford, not too long ago, that found that when they surveyed uh, all uh, these Americans, thousands of Americans, and they tried to figure out what are the most important parts of their identity, what are the most important things that they identify as, 
Do you want to know what the single most influential aspect of Americans' identity is? Single most influential factor. I'll tell you what it's not. It's not their race, it's not our gender, it's not our ethnicity, and it's definitely not our religion. The single greatest influencing factor on the American identity is their political affiliation. This is the thing that they want you to know the quickest. This is the thing we want you to understand the fastest. This is the thing that governs so much of how we show up in the world, how we think, how we talk, how we act. This is the biggest driving influencer on who we are as people and how we show up in the world. And that same study found that one of the reasons for this is because there's no corresponding pressures to moderate disapproval of political opponents. In fact, the rhetoric and behavior of party leaders suggest to voters that it's perfectly acceptable to treat opponents with disdain. I would argue if you look at the discourse we're in, it's not only acceptable, it's applauded. You're heroic. You're commended for showing disdain for the persons on the other side. And so in this sense, individuals have greater freedom to discriminate against out party supporters. So let's bring it back to the conversation we're having today. It appears that if Jesus showed up today in October of 2024 and showed up amongst the American folks heading into another contentious election, it seems like what Jesus would say, a slight variation on here in Matthew 5, is he would say, you have heard it said on your favorite news channel. <laughs> you have heard it said on MSNBC. You have heard it said on CNN. You have heard it said on Fox News. But I say to you, you have heard it said, and for far too long, you, my followers, you've taken your cues, you've taken your leads and your lines and your beliefs and your worldview, you've taken all of that from your favorite news source rather than my actual teachings. And here's the problem with that. When we live this way, what does Jesus say? Verses 46 and 47. If you only, back to that sort of Stanford study, if you're only kind to those, if you only love those who love you, who vote like you, who see the world like you do, who look at the world and look at others the same, look at issues the same way you do, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even Gentiles do the same. Put simply, Jesus is essentially asking us, if this is the way in which you behave, are you any different? Maybe it's hard question time. Do you want to be any different? Now, some of you do. For the last couple of years, I have had an ongoing conversation with so many of you in coffee shops, in my office, around the state we find ourselves in as American Christians and just the desire to be different. I've talked with so many of you and so many people in our community who they want to be different. They want the name Christian to mean something better than what it presently means but we don't know how to get there. And so if that's you too, if you find yourself in that place where you're like, yes, 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 I want to be different. I don't want to be just like everyone else. I want to look and sound and walk and talk more like the person I claim to worship. Well, that's great. If we're going to do that, then we're going to have to fundamentally sort of unpack what does it mean to actually love your enemy? And for me, at least, I have found that it's more helpful to sort of come at it from the angle of, in order to understand what it means, you got to first understand what it doesn't mean, okay? So here's what it does not mean. When you leave here today, for the rest of this election cycle, for the rest of your life, what loving your enemy does not mean is it doesn't mean you have to be silent. It doesn't mean that from this day forth, now you just have to cork it and never talk about the things that are important to you, never talk about the causes that are important to you, never use your voice to champion 
the causes that are so near and dear to your heart, the people that you know are suffering, who are marginalized, who are oppressed, it doesn't mean you have to be silent. It also doesn't mean you have to lie or pretend. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Thanksgiving is literally less than a month away, and you've already planned, okay? I can be my full self with this person, and I'm going to be like 60% of myself with this person, and this person, we're literally only talking about our love for mashed potatoes, okay? It's just safer that way. It's just safer that way. We just sort of keep it right to the Thanksgiving football sort of conversation, and I'm not joking about that. Someone pulled me aside in between services and said, there are some people in my life who, if I were to be honest about who I am, they would harm me with that information. And so what I am not saying is that there's not some instances. I'm just saying you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to, number three, you don't have to hide who you are. And again, how God made you. And maybe your unique calling on this planet to champion, to advocate for this cause or that cause. That's not what loving our enemies means. And how do we know this? Because scripture tells us this. The great chapter on love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says this, love never gives up, it never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Put differently, what loving your enemies requires is not you to become small, not you to become a different version of yourself, and it certainly does not require you to lie. But what it does require, what it will require of you for the rest of your life, is if you are going to dare to call yourself a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to think long and hard about, not if, but how you hold your beliefs. How you hold the worldview that you have. It means becoming a lot more intentional, particularly with those enemies in your life. So Kyle, what does that mean? What does that look like? And again, Scripture is immensely helpful to us. If we're going to have a shot this political season of reclaiming one of the hallmark characteristics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be people who love those who we don't align with, the number one, James chapter 1, verse 19, we've got to get back to being people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and again, this is also in the greatest hits category, right? Y'all know the third line, slow to get angry. Good Lord, you could end the sermon right there. If we could just do that, sweet Jesus, we would be miles ahead. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And if you're reading this and you're like, I don't know how I'm doing in this camp, ask yourself this question. Lately, lately, when you bump into someone who you don't agree with, you don't align with, are you quicker to categorize them or be curious about them? Which impulse comes quicker? The impulse to go, oh, yep, knew it, you're one of them. <laughs> or is there a quicker impulse inside of you to get curious? Curiosity doesn't mean agreeing. It doesn't mean even supporting. But it means that you are at least willing to remember that every single person you come into contact with is made in the image and likeness of God. And so every single person underneath all of their hard stances and hard views, underneath all that lies a beloved child of God. This is why in our tradition, for centuries, we have written prayers uh, that commend us back to this practice. The prayer of St. Francis. I love this prayer so much. There's an excerpt in the middle of that prayer that says this, O oh Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. If you signed out to be a follower of Jesus, it's more blessed to give than receive. This is who we are. It's who we're supposed to be. Number two, if we want to reclaim 
this aspect of our identity. When we do speak, so again, sometimes we gotta, we gotta, I did slow to speak first. When we do speak, we've got to reclaim this ethic here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 of being people who, when we speak the truth, we do so in love. Again, I'm not saying don't speak, but I'm saying you've got to be a lot more intentional. We've got to be a lot more intentional in how we come across. I love that line from Maya Angelou that said this, that no one remembers what you said, no one remembers what you did. The only thing ever that will be remembered about you will be what? How you made them feel. How do you make people feel when you talk to them? Do they feel respected? Do they feel valued? Do they feel empathized with? Do they feel like uh, you are genuinely curious and interested in their life and where they're coming from and their past experience? Or do they feel inferior to you? Do they feel insulted by you? Do they feel dumb every time they're around you saying what they think or believe? And I'll just say this. It is quite comical to me that whenever we are in dialogue uh, with people who we oppose on some issue or another, we love to use the tactics of insulting and belittling and intimidation. And this is just me, so this is just Kyle. In my experience, I have yet to meet a single person who when I asked them how they came to this particular view, they said, oh, I got insulted into it. <laughs> it was great, it was such a great experience. They made fun of me, they made fun of my mom, like they poked fun at all the different things that I've ever been a part of and stood for, and I said, where can I sign up? <laughs> where are we going next, what are we doing now? And then we sit over there, fundamentally confused as to why are we not getting our point across? So forget whether or not it's faithful, just for a quick second. It's also not effective. And thirdly and finally, if we're going to have a shot at reclaiming this aspect of our identity, we better take a long, hard look at another thing that Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians. In chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, Paul, here, here's the context, here's the context. Paul is getting uh, persecuted himself. His friends are getting arrested, persecuted. Some are even being murdered by their enemies, these people who believe differently than the followers of Jesus at that time. And so for Paul to say this, means something entirely different. He's not saying this from the comforts of 2024 and behind a Facebook message board. He's saying this knowing that his own life has been threatened because he believes differently than the people and the rulers around him. And so for him to say this, he's earned the right to say this. We aren't fighting against human enemies, Paul writes but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Put simply, what Paul is reminding these Christians of is not to fall into the trap of thinking that these people that you disagree with are the real enemy. They are not the real enemy. The real enemy are the voices in this world, some of which are coming from you know, political authorities, some of which are coming from other sources and other voices. Some are coming from spiritual realms that we don't fully understand. And they're telling us, they're trying to tell us that that person, that group, that party, they're the enemy, they're the problem. And so long as they do that, the real problems of poverty, of oppression, of people being marginalized, of people being excluded, all of the issues that are near and dear to all of our hearts, we take our eyes off those issues because we're too busy saying, you are the issue, you are the problem. And the longer that goes on, guess what happens to the issue? It only gets worse. By the way, 
This is marital counseling 101. When Marie and I first got married, we got bickering and bickering and bickering and bickering about different things. Why? Because when you're early on in a relationship, this is how you fight. Something happens, you're the issue. No, you're the issue. No, you're the issue. No, you're the issue. And you come to find every marriage and family therapist that's worth anything will tell you that that is the most immature and most ineffective way to solve a problem. The best way to solve a problem is to move to the side of your partner and start fighting the real issue. This week, when they changed our soccer practice for the fourth time and location, and I got ticked off at my wife at first, we were largely ineffective until we finally said, I'm not mad at you. Yeah, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at that. Until we as a people are willing to get shoulder to shoulder and say, that's the real thing we're concerned about. We're not going to get anywhere. In fact, I'll even dare to give you an example of where this is happening in the American political landscape in which we're living in. Okay? There's no easy, there's no perfect example of this, but this is the closest we are right now. Right now, more than 80% of Americans, 80%, believe we've got to do something about gun violence in this country. Over 80%. That's the closest we're going to get to 100, quite frankly. And then we disagree on the how. We disagree on the methods for how to figure this out. But most People in this country look at the current situation and they say, good God, this is the worst. I'm so tired of seeing another mass shooting on my news cycle. I'm so tired of seeing a list of kids' names. I'm so tired of my kid coming home from school and telling me that for hours they had to practice lockdown drills. We can disagree on the how, but most of us, with a heartbeat, look at that situation and we say, something has to change but we continue to make very little to no progress on this conversation, even though, again, 80 plus percent, this was a poll done by Fox News several, weeks, several months ago, even though we are in alignment, we can't get past how good it feels to say, and you're, you're the one that's stopping it. No, you're the one that's stopping it. No, you're the one that's stopping it. No, you're the issue. 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 And so the powers and principalities at work in this world keep us hating one another. Meanwhile, it's literally killing us. I'll close here. This week, um, Daniel, our youth pastor and missions director, and I huddled up because we were talking about MLK weekend. Uh, we're going to, if you're new to our church, every MLK weekend we do a bunch of service projects for you and your families to join in and to serve, to do something selfless for our local community. And after we left the meeting, I got to thinking about probably one of my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quotes that goes like this. I have decided to stick with love. For hate is too great a burden to bear. I don't know about you, but I've now reached the point in my life where hate has become too great a burden to bear. I'm so tired of passively, actively hating someone I don't even know, but I disagree on this particular conversation. I'm so tired of doing the mental gymnastics of always trying to figure out and qualify, well, am I allowed to be friends with this person? Or can, am, I allowed to, am I too close to this person or this group because we don't agree on all the things? Or this family member, am I allowed to be super chummy with this person even though on that issue that I'm really passionate about, we're not on the same page? Who am I supposed to like? Who am I not supposed to like? Who am I supposed to, I have to keep up with which group is in, which group is out? Are you, am I alone in this? Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired? 
of spending all of your time trying to figure out who you're allowed to be nice to, who you're allowed to be decent to, who you're allowed to enjoy, even if you don't agree with every aspect of who they are. Maybe not. Maybe some of you are like, nah, man, I'm good. I got, I got plenty of stuff left in the engine for this. And um, <laughs> if that's you, I got nothing for you. I got nothing for you. But if you're tired too, there's a way out of this. There's a way out of this where you still get to hold true to who you are. You still get to hold true to the things that you're passionate about. But you get to do so in a way that actually starts looking a little bit more like the Jesus we claim to follow. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.